Assalamu alaikum. That is, uh, may peace be upon all of you. Okay, so I will just put this here to make it easier. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Good? Yeah? Okay. Um, so tonight, uh, we will be hearing uh, about Moses, peace be upon him, Jesus, peace be upon him, and Muhammad, peace be upon him. And uh, what these three prophets mean, according to Muslims, uh, who are they, what did they preach, and uh, what do they mean to Muslims? Uh, maybe some of you are wondering, uh, why are we mentioning two out of the three, Moses, peace be upon him, and Jesus, peace be upon him? Uh, but what you'll begin to see is that according to Islam, um, <coughs> these men are linked, and linked in the most beautiful way. And that is that they preached uh, the same message. <coughs> uh, interestingly, uh, these three prophets had revelations, uh, Moses with the Torah, uh, Jesus with the Gospel and uh, Prophet Muhammad with the uh, Quran. Uh, today they are looked at as the main figures of the three Abrahamic faiths, um, but in Islam they are looked at as the uh, three founders of the unifying belief in one God and the true and righteous. <coughs> today we are also fortunate enough to have Brother uh, Ali Atai as our speaker for tonight. Uh, Brother Ali Atai is president and founder of the Muslim Interfaith Council. Uh, he studied at Dar al Mustafa. And uh, he's also working towards his master's degree in um, uh, Theological Union in Berkeley, California, in uh, Biblical Studies. So we're here to share with you and uh, expand on the Islamic perspective of Moses, peace be upon him, Jesus, peace be upon him, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, and the similarities between the messages they preached. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Brother Elia <laughs> Assalamualaikum. <laughs> And I've just casted a spell on all of you. <laughs> Muslims can speak in tongues as well. Um, I'd like to thank the MSA at UCLA. It's my first time here at UCLA. Beautiful campus for uh, the willingness to share um, with respect to these issues, the touchy subject. Um, I ask all of you to be patient with me. You might hear things that you might not agree with. Or you might feel like, you know, this guy is, he's full of, you know what, just please try to keep your comments to yourself until the end. We'll take questions and comments, give you a chance to, to respond or ask questions. And please don't throw anything at me. Um, if you do, make sure it's something soft like uh, fruit or something. <laughs> anyway, um, I'd like to begin by telling you a true story. Maybe some of you have heard this story from me before. It's very interesting. kind of explains the... Um, times we're living in. So a few years ago I was at a church in the South Bay um, on one fine Sunday morning and uh, I was in fellowship with the church there and we were doing an interfaith dialogue and when, we, when I exited the church uh, I found myself suddenly surrounded or ambushed by a group of fundamentalist evangelical Christians and there was a certain older lady that approached me she was holding her Bible uh, and she didn't like the idea that Muslims and Christians were meeting in the church and they were speaking about, you know, God and Jesus and Muhammad, peace be upon both of them, um, with respect and civility. So she approached me and uh, she proceeded to tell me or inform me about how my prophet, meaning the holy prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, went into Europe and slaughtered all of the Europeans. Right? So, you know, I said, I don't know who you're thinking about. Vlad the Impaler or someone, Hitler. Okay, so the prophet did not leave the Arabian Peninsula in the 23 years of his prophetic career. And she said, no, I think it's very well documented. So hmm, interesting. And then she quoted a verse of the Quran to me, right, which ostensibly uh, seems to advocate violence, right? Um, and she said, see, it's right here, it's in your book and whatnot. 
So, in order to demonstrate her erroneous methodology, I quoted a verse from the Bible back to her. That seems to advocate violence. It was Luke 19, 27, which Jesus says, Those enemies that do not accept me as their king, bring them hither and slay them before me. Right? Cut their throats in my very presence. Expecting her to say, well, you know, you're not looking at the context. And then I would say, exactly. That was my whole point. But she didn't say that. She made a very interesting comment. She said, that is not in my Bible. So I said, can I see your Bible? And she said, sure. And I showed her the verse. And I'll never forget this. She looked at the verse, looked at me, looked back at the verse, looked at me again, closed her book, smiled a little bit, and said, quote, I know who you are, Satan. <laughs> And then she proceeded to do a live exorcism on me. Yeah. And she was, you know, she was, she was extracting the demons. And, uh, you know, there was a crowd gathering. And, you know, I couldn't help myself. So I was like... I was, I was bugging out. And I fell down to one knee. And then she said... And then she helped me back up. And she said, how do you feel? And I said, I said, Allah. And she's like, ah. It didn't work. There's another, there was a Coptic Christian lady who grabbed me by my shirt one time and she was trying to extract the demon. So I'd like to assure the Christians in the audience that um, I'm not demon possessed, at least not tonight. Um, so the point of that is that we need to transcend this type of superficial fundamentalist mentality of some of our co religionists uh, and truly try to understand each other. So the point, you know, the point isn't to agree, although I certainly won't be offended if you agree with me by the end of the night. That's not the point. The point is to truly understand, right? To understand. Because when you understand someone, you tend to respect them. And that's the point, is to gain respect. So that no sides, so sides are given an, evil, an even platform, and no side is made to look less than human, because that's how genocides begin. So, I'm going to begin by saying, hold on to your hats, and to your hijabs and hair pieces. Um, Muslims believe that Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, peace be upon all of them, uh, are brothers in faith. Muslims believe that they were all Muslim prophets. Now you're probably thinking, if you're non-Muslim, I thought Islam started in Arabia 1400 years ago. Muslims don't actually believe that. Muslims believe that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, perfected the religion of Islam. Right? If I can even use the word religion, I don't like that word because Islam is a holistic way of living, it's not just a religion. Um, so, the final verse of the Qur'an revealed to the Holy Prophet was, This day I have perfected your religion for you, and completed my favors upon you. So the religion is perfectly complete, thus he is the final messenger of God. Uh, but Muslims believe that all of the prophets, even from the first human being, Adam, was a Muslim. Now I'll explain that further. The word Islam is the infinitive construct of the fourth verbal form in Arabic, meaning submission or surrender, submission unto the will of God. This is the essence of the teaching of the great prophets. This is the essence of the teaching, submission unto the will of God. The Quran says, Shara ala kuminat dini ma wasabihi nuhan. He says, the same religion has he established for you as that which he enjoined on Noah. And that which we have sent by inspiration to thee. And that which we have enjoined on Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. So yes, they did have tribal distinctions. For example, Moses was a Levite. That was his tribal distinction. If the Holy Prophet Moses were to enter into this room right now, and I had the honor and privilege of speaking to him, and I asked him, oh, messenger of God, are you a Jew? Please shut that off, no, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> I'm so offended. You know what, I have to actually turn mine off. Thanks for the reminder, actually. Sorry. Yeah, this is so annoying. Anyway, um, if he were to walk into the room and I said, oh, Moses, are you a Jew? He would probably say, no, I'm a Levite. Why would he say that? Because he would think that I was referring to a tribal distinction, right? Because Moses is not from, from Judah. He's not a descendant of Judah. He's from Levi, right? So if I said, oh, Moses, are you a practitioner of Judaism? 
he would probably not know what I was talking about because the word Yehudi in Hebrew was not used as a spiritual distinction until the 8th century of the Common Era, before the Common Era, after the divide of the kingdom and the Assyrians attacked the northern kingdom of Israel and 10 of the 12 tribes were extinguished or wiped out or exiled. There's a, there's a theory they went to Afghanistan, God knows. Um, but the two tribes that were left, Judah and Benjamin, Judah being the older brother and the largest tribe, so the Jews became known as Jews as the name of a religion. Now if the Holy Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, were to enter into this room, which is according to the Islamic Christology, it's very possible because Muslims believe in the second coming of Christ and maybe he'll visit UCLA, I don't know. It's certainly possible. And he were to come into this room and I said, Oh Jesus, oh Messiah, oh Christ, oh Messenger of God, are you a Christian? He would not know what I was talking about because this word he never heard in his life. Well, he wouldn't know, you know unless you believe that Jesus is God. It's a separate issue. Uh, but leaving the dogmatic aspect aside for now, the, f the term Christian, according to the book of Acts, was first used as a derogatory statement for people who believed in Christ when the Jews were expelling them in the synagogue. Um, so I would expect Jesus to say, uh, my religion is a religion of submission unto the will of God. And that's what Islam is. Now Christians believe that Jesus also has a tribal distinction, that he's, uh, he's a descendant of David from the tribe of Judah, which um, according to Muslims is unsubstantiated. Muslims don't believe he has a tribal distinction at all, but that's a separate issue. We can deal with that later if you like. Now, if the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, walked into this room and I said, Oh, Messenger of God, uh, I'm a Muslim. Are you a Muslim? I would expect him to say, Alhamdulillah, praise be to God. That's a spiritual distinction. He does have a tribal distinction. He's from a clan called Bani Hashim. He's from a tribe called Quraysh. But those are tribal distinctions. The spiritual distinction is Muslim. So Islam transcends tribe, country, race, and blood. Right? There's no, there's no tribe called Muslim. There's no country called Islam land. Right? Um, and it's really interesting because I get people all the time asking me, are, they say, are you Islam? Are you from Islam? <laughs> you know? And if you're not laughing at that, you're probably one of the people that made my mistake. <laughs> um, so, in, in the Gospel of Mark, now, you know, I was told not to quote the Bible too much. You know, kind of makes people antsy. Uh, but here's the thing. The Quran talks about Ahlil Kitab. Right, the people of the book. And the exegetes of the Quran, they're called Mufassirin, they say Ahlil Kitab, people of the book, are Jews and Christians. Which, what Kitab? What book? Right, Katuv in Hebrew, the Kitabul Muqaddas, the Holy Bible. Right? So the Quran mentions the people of the Bible. Um, and with respect to the Quran, there are three functions of the Quran uh, when dealing with previous dispensations. The Quran corrects those previous dispensations, abrogates certain aspects as well, um, and confirms certain aspects. So, uh, essentially, me quoting the Bible is quoting uh, from our scripture as well. There are elements of truth in the Bible, and the Quran says so. So, you know, just to make my point clear, in Mark chapter 3, right, it's the earliest gospel according to the New Testament scholars, written around 70, the common era, the crowd gathers, they go to Christ, and they say, Behold, your mother and your brother, probably Mary and uh, presumably James the just. Uh, and Jesus says, Who are my mother and my brother? Whoever does the will of God. Right? And then he says, according to the Greek, and Jesus probably didn't speak Greek. Uh, he spoke of Syriac, which is uh, in the northern dialect of Syriac, the Galilean dialect of Syriac, um, which is actually very close to Arabic, by the way a certain uh, difference between the... It's also called late Aramaic. Uh, but nonetheless, the New Testament is in Greek. The originals are in Greek. So in the New Testament, in the Greek, he says, Hutas adelphos mu kai adelphe kai maiter estin. Whoever does the will of God is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Whoever does the will of God. Now that's the definition of a Muslim. Now in Matthew 5, 9, right, so... I don't want to get too technical, but there's, there's a hypothetical source document called Q, uh, also called the Sayings Gospel. Now, this is um, 
And the most widely held theory by New Testament scholars is that Matthew and Luke had access to a, another source that Mark did not have access to. And this explains the so-called synoptic problem, why Matthew and Luke have material in common that is missing from Mark. So scholars believe that the Q source material uh, predates the Pauline letters and epistles. So it's very early and probably uh, is the most representative of the authentic statements of Christ. So in Matthew 5 and 9, right, this is the Sermon on the Mount, right, the Beatitudes. Jesus says in the English translation, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And the Greek word for peacemaker is a compound word made up of ireni and poeo, which means peace and to do, respectively. Um, now, interestingly, I was able to get my hands on uh, a Peshitta translation of the New Testament. The Peshitta is the translation of the Greek back into the original language of Christ. This was done in the 4th century of the Common Era. It is the authorized Syriac translation of the New Testament, which replaced Tatian's Diatessaron at the time. Um, what is that? Oh, interesting. I thought it was another cell phone. Yes, 7 p.m. So, I looked up this verse, 5-9 in the Peshitta. You know, to get a sense of what Jesus probably would have said in his own language. And the verse reads, Blessed are those who who make shalom or shalom or salam. Blessed are those who make salam. How do you say that in Arabic? Muslim. They shall be called the children of Allah in the metaphorical sense, not in the literal sense, obviously. So the word for God uh, in, the, in the dialect of Jesus, in the northern uh, Palestinian or Galilean dialect of Aramaic, is Allah. Right? There's indications in the New Testament as well, like in Matthew you know, and, and Peter, they find out maybe this is a disciple of Jesus and they probably saw Peter hanging around with Jesus. Or it was because he just spoke and they could recognize this man has a, an accent, a, a northern Galilean accent. So the, the Syriac is a little bit different. Um, but that's interesting. So the word Muslim, then, is the active participle of the fourth form. Now, uh, <coughs> the corresponding Hebrew verbal form is called the hephil, right? And the word Muslim in Hebrew is mashlim. Uh, so uh, Matthew 5, 9 in Hebrew would have probably sounded like buruk et ha mashlimim, right? Blessed are the mashlimim, blessed are the muslimim, right? Which is the plural of Muslim, which is... Very interesting. Uh, now, interestingly also, in, in Luke and in John, um, when Jesus comes to his disciples, right, he uses a very interesting greeting. Right? He says, peace be with you, in some translations, or peace be upon you. Right? Shalom Aleichem. This is a greeting that Muslims also use. Muslims will say this is a greeting that all the prophets use. Assalamu Alaikum. Right? There was a movie in 1992, a Spike Lee movie called Malcolm X, which kind of put this phrase into the popular culture, right? Assalamu alaikum, right? That means peace be upon you, right? So the Quran says, "Ida jaaka ladina yu'minuna bi ayatina faqul salamun alaikum kataba rabbukum ala nafsi rahma." When you come into contact with those who believe in our sign, say peace be upon thee. Thy Lord has inscribed upon His own self the, low, the rule of mercy. This is the Muslim greeting. There's a, there's, a, there's a hadith, there's a statement uh, of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, there, there, there's a great, vast amount of literature, um, eschatological literature, signs of the end of time and whatnot. So the Prophet said, um, in a rigorously authenticated tradition, he said that towards the end of time, the youth will greet each other with insults, right, and not the greeting of peace. And I go to high schools a lot, you know, and I just sit there and I listen to some of the youth. What's up, foo? <laughs> What's up, dog? What's up, B? What's going on, mofo? I'm like, what? Is your friend? Right? Very, very interesting. And I thought, you know, if I, if I went up to like an Arab guy in, in Yemen, I said, Kaif al Hadya Kalb. Probably wouldn't uh, go over very well. Uh, but, you know, it's, like I said, it's the sign of the times. Now, this may come as a shock, but one of the founding, foundational, I should say, principles of the Islamic tradition is love. Wow. 
Yes. Now, there's a lot of ignorance. Now, when I was growing up in the 80s, before the internet, you know, this is when we were calling up for the Encyclopedia Britannica and things like that. Um, people, most people, most Americans, didn't know anything about Islam, right? So the cup was uh, empty, right? But nowadays, because of this information explosion, people are suddenly experts because they went on IHateMuslim.com or something, right? <laughs> so the cup is full, but it's full of murky water. So that's a problem. Um, i give you an example. When I was an undergrad at Cal Poly, pre-9-11, I don't want to give away my age too much, but um, 1999 or so. One of my, my roommate, who's a brother from Afghanistan, he was uh, talking to a non-Muslim student in his finance class about the MSA, and you know, then we do this and that, and this, and this non-Muslim student said, you know, I don't know anything about Islam. Actually, I'll draw on the board what I know about Islam. And he wasn't trying to be funny or anything. He was being very honest, so he went to the board and he drew a camel, and a pyramid, and a bomb, TNT, right? And that was his extent of Islamic knowledge. And most people are educated by the media, right? If you ask people, you know, what do you know about, what do you know about Jesus Christ? What do you know about the four Gospels? Well, I watch Mel Gibson's movie, and according to the movie, well, you know, Mel Gibson wrote his own Gospel. Right? That's called the Gospel according to Mel Gibson. You can't combine all four Gospels and call it a biblical Gospel. So that's, that's problematic, and the media has a definite effect. Um, there was uh, one of my friends, um, he's an Iranian uh, brother, his mother is a, a nurse at a hospital, and uh, she's been there for years, right? And uh, another nurse, a non-Muslim nurse, finally worked up the courage to ask her, you know, you have an accent, where are you from? And uh, she said, oh, I'm from Iran. And then the other nurse said, really? But you're such a nice person! <laughs> Interesting. Um, oh, here's something. Maybe you've heard me tell this before. I was at a church sermon one time. Uh, the pastor was giving a talk called, Why I Am Not a Muslim. And, you know, it wasn't slanderous. It was a little polemical. But then he showed this video, right? It's a very interesting video. And the first frame of the video was the Trade Center Towers burning. It was in black and white. It's in slow motion. Right? And then it says, you know, this voice over. You know what the movie guy? It says, in the world. It said, uh, they're amongst us. Right? And then it showed a Muslim woman with a headscarf buying produce at the supermarket. And then it said, they go to our schools. And it showed a little tiny, like, eight-year-old, remind me of my daughter, you know, with a little hijab, a headscarf. She had a little backpack, Dora the Explorer backpack. She, she's walking by the crossing guard. They go to our schools. Right? And then it said, they work in our cities, and it showed a guy, a Sikh in a, in a turban, driving a cab. <laughs> and if you don't know the difference between a Sikh and a Muslim, you shouldn't be making videos about Islam. Right? I mean, yeah, Muslims wear turbans, it's a sunnah of the messenger. Uh, you know, the Levites wore turbans, the, the Torah says that Aaron wore a turban. Uh, but if you don't know the difference, then something, there's something wrong there. Uh, so back to this uh, issue of love, this foundational principle. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, Muhammad, peace be upon him, said in a rigorously authenticated tradition, he said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام said, None of you truly believe until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. Now, the scholars of hadith have said that the word brother in this hadith does not just mean your Muslim brother, right? but your brother or sister in the children of Adam, because the male gender encapsulates the female gender. Like if I say, you know, mankind, I'm not just talking about men, right, to get to understand that. Uh, or even the Greek word, anthropoi, meaning men, also means women, right? If I say, salam alaikum, which is the second person plural, uh, masculine, it includes women, right? Um, so, essentially the prophet is saying, none of you truly believe until you love for your brother or sister in the children of Adam what you love for yourself. So these two aspects of universality and love are absolutely foundational in the Islamic tradition. Absolutely foundational. We cannot ignore it. We cannot ignore it. Uh, one of the exalted titles of the Prophet in the Quran is Rahmatil lil Alameen, which means a mercy sent unto all the worlds. He's a mercy sent unto the cosmos, all the world. Another hadith of the Prophet, he said, لا تدخلوا الجنة حتى تؤمنوا ولا تؤمنوا حتى تحبوا None of you will enter paradise 
until you truly believe. And none of you would truly believe until you love one another. Shall I tell you of something that will increase your love? And they said, yes. And he said, Afshu salam abaynakum. Spread peace amongst yourselves. Spread peace amongst yourselves. So this is important. Um, and the Prophet had you know, deep concern for people. There's many examples of that. Now, this is something interesting. Um, Muslim scholars have actually identified various typologies or prophecies of the Holy Prophet in the biblical text, just as many Christian scholars have also identified many typologies of Christ in the Bible as well. Um, for example, in uh, Proto-Isaiah, Emmanuel, or uh, uh, Suffering Servant of Deutero-Isaiah, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, that a king shall come from Bethlehem, and so on and so forth. Now, according to uh, Justin Martyr, he was a uh, probably the most famous early Christian apologist and heresiologists. Um, he's also the, uh, the father of the Logos theology. He said that fulfillment of prophecy is the strongest argument one can make uh, to uh, legitimize Jesus as the true Christ, even more so than miracles. So the Quran says that that those to whom we gave the previous revelations they know the prophet like they know one of their own sons. In other words, the descriptions of the prophet given in the previous revelations, which includes the Bible, are so succinct and perfect that they'll recognize the prophet like they know one of their own sons. The Quran also says that the Nabi al-Ummi, which is usually translated as uh, the uh, unlettered prophet, but Ummi is also the Arabic word for Gentile, right? the Gentile prophet. Right. And this is interesting because in, in Deutero Isaiah chapter 42, you know, we have this, uh, this um, description of this, of this person called the Eved Adonai, right? the, the slave of God. Uh, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one, and whom my soul delights. And Eved obviously is the uh, word Abd in Arabic meaning servant, which is one of the titles of the Holy Prophet. And in this passage, he's called Livrith Am Leorgoyim, a covenant for all people, a light for the Gentiles. Right? So the Quran says that the Gentile prophet, Maktuban Enda Umfi Torati Wal Injil, is prophesied by name in the Torah and in the Gospel. Now, there's an interesting uh, story when the prophet was coming into Medina um, uh, for the Hijrah, his, his migration north. There was a Jewish rabbi in the city uh, who made an interesting comment when he saw the prophet for the first time. He said to quote him directly, he narrates the hadith himself. He said, Araftu anna wajhahu He said, I knew that his face was not the face of a liar. And it's probably because the prophet had an honest face, and he did, but it's also because he recognized the prophet, peace be upon him, physically. Now, this is, this is interesting. And I'll end with this, inshallah, God willing. So I want time for What time am I supposed to stop talking? What time do you want me to shut up? Okay. So there's, uh, there's a book in the Old Testament. Okay. Kind of bear with me here. It's called the Song of Songs. Okay. Uh, in the King James Version, it's called the Song of Solomon. In the Roman Catholic Version, it's called the Canticle of Canticles. In the Hebrew, it's called Shira Hashirim, so, uh, which means the Song of Songs, or the best song, because there's no superlative form in the Hebrew language, like Arabic has a superlative. In order to make something superlative in Hebrew, you have to repeat it in the plural and precede it with a definite article. For example, the best king is the king of kings, right? The best book is the book of books. The best song is the Song of Songs, the Shira Hashirim. Scholars believe that this poem was penned some 3,000 years ago, right? We're going to kind of use it as our anchor um, when looking at the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So it begins, chapter 5, verse 10, okay, Song of Songs. If you have a Bible, you can read along with me. Um, but I'll be quoting the Hebrew because it's very interesting and it's very important that we study original languages. 
So it says, Dodi Sach Ve'adom. My beloved is white and red. So one of the titles, the most exalted title of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the Islamic tradition is Habibullah, the beloved of God. Just like Abraham is called the friend of God and Moses is called the Kalimullah, the one who spoke with God. Jesus is called a word from God. The Prophet is called the beloved of God. Now, there's a genre of uh, Islamic literature called the Shama'il. Uh, and this genre deals with outward and inward aspects of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. It's a very vast genre of literature. Uh, probably the most famous work in this genre is called uh, uh, Shama'il an nabawiyyah by a scholar named Abu Musa al tirmidhi So in this, uh, in this work, he describes the Prophet outwardly and inwardly, physical description of the Prophet, and also his character. Very, uh, very, very vast genre of literature in the Islamic tradition. And there's several hadith that mention that the Prophet's complexion, right, or his skin that touched the wind and sun, like, for example, one of his companions named Imam Ali, Karamullah Wajha, he said that the Prophet's skin was a white mix with redness. So the Song of Solomon says here in chapter 5, verse 10, Dodi, my beloved, Sahve Adom, is white and red. Dagul Mervava, chief amongst 10,000. <coughs> now this, uh, this is interesting because this, uh, this idea of him being chief amongst 10,000 is also found in uh, various Jewish uh, apocalyptic literature like the book of Enoch, it's also mentioned in the book of Daniel. The uh, book of Deuteronomy mentions someone coming from Mount Paran uh, um, with 10,000 saints and a fiery law in his right hand. Right? So when the prophet came into Mecca right, in the 10th year of the Hijrah, so it's about 630 of the Common Era, he came with 10,000 companions. Right? And he came into the city, and this is a city that had thrown him out. Right? They had um, been actively fighting him for over 20 years and tried, tried to kill him uh, and have killed successfully many of his companions and family members and he came into the city and they knew that he was well within his rights to take vengeance so he called everyone out of their houses and he stood up and he said لا تثريب عليكم اليوم there's no blemish upon you today يغفر الله لكم God has forgiven all of you so the Prophet's character is magnanimous he forgives in a position of power if someone's about to kill you, and you turn to your, your murderer and you say, I forgive you, or may God forgive you, that's very noble. But imagine someone's been trying to kill you for over 20 years and has been killing your family members and companions for over 20 years, and now you're in a position to kill them and you forgive them. So the Prophet has magnanimous character. There was a battle in which the Prophet was um, <coughs> participating in, called Ghazwat Uhud. And, uh, during this battle, the Prophet suffered injuries to his noble face, it was blood streaming down his face. And the companion saw him in the, in, I mean, in the thick of battle, and his hands were raised. So his companions thought that the Prophet is cursing his enemies, and that he's calling down for the angels to come, and so on and so forth. And they heard what the Prophet actually said. And the Prophet said, and it's recorded, Allahumma mahdi qawmi fa'innahum la ya'lamun. God guide my people, for they don't know. Even in such circumstances, uh, the Prophet uh, um, preferred the guidance of his people, right? And this is something we hear a lot about Jesus, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. But we never hear that about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We always hear that he's a warlord or something like that. Well, why, why is that? Right? So we have, to, we have to do our own research, and these are, this is very interesting. So then, uh, the... Uh, it continues, I'm running out of time here, I want to leave some time for questions. It says, Rosho Ketem Paz, back to the Hebrew of the Shira Hashirim. His head is like gold. His locks are wavy and black as a raven. So again, according to Shema'i literature, um, the Prophet, peace be upon him, had neither straight nor curly hair, but wavy. It was very black, even in his 60s. The companions actually, this is how much they love the Prophet. They actually <laughs> would notice these tiny little things, right? They, they counted 11 white hairs on his head, and most of them were at his temples. I mean, they would notice these really minute kind of details, because that's a sign that you love someone, 
right? You're not just writing down what someone said, right? You want to know everything about your beloved, everything about them, right? Uh, and black as a raven. Now, interestingly, the Hebrew word here uh, for raven, which is uh, orev, is made up of three letters, uh, ayin, resh, and bet, or ayin, uh, ra, and ba, which is arab. Uh, so the word uh, raven in Hebrew is also the word for arab. Uh, so it can be translated, although I've never seen a translation like this, for obvious reasons. It can be translated, his head is like gold, his locks are wavy and black as an Arab. And then it continues, um, and I'm running out of time, but I want to get to the, uh, some of the highlights here. It's about seven verses long. Um, but we get down to verse 16, okay, 516. Um, and the poet said, and this is very interesting, it says, Hikko mum thakim. It says, his mouth is most sweet. Vikullo Muhammadim. He is altogether lovely. Now, this word Muhammadim in Hebrew uh, has a plural ending. The im is a plural ending. If you take off the plural, <coughs> the plural of respect, you're left with four Hebrew radicals. Memchet mem dalit, which is the exact spelling of the name Muhammad. Uh, so the translation in English, every translation virtually says, his mouth is most sweet. He is altogether lovely. Right? But when you drop the plural, you have the name Muhammad. Right? This is very interesting. This is, this is the actual name of the Prophet, peace be upon him, in the Old Testament, in the Shira Hashirim. And the poet continues, he concludes, Zehdudi, this is my beloved. Bizehre'i, this is my friend. Banu Jerusalem, O daughters of Jerusalem. So that's very interesting. Um, Okay, five more minutes. So, how do Muslims account for, you know, it's one thing to say that Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, peace be upon them, are brothers in faith. How do Muslims account for different theologies within these three religions? Um, Muslims believe that the theology of all three of these men uh, was the same, right? Uh, and that they believed in God as an absolute uh, one entity. They believe in radical monotheism. So obviously Muslims don't confirm uh, begotten sonship of Christ um, or uh, belief in a triune deity, which are obviously very important uh, for Christians, or orthodoxy at least. Um, and the evidence of this is when we go to the Torah, right, the modern day Torah, we have the great Shema. Right? You guys probably heard of the Shema. Uh, Shema Israel Adonai Elohim Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, a scribe comes to Christ, right, in the Gospel of Mark, again, which is the earliest gospel, and he says, uh, he says, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus will repeat the Shema, verbatim. Of course, it's in the Greek, uh, because the New Testament's in Greek. But he probably quoted it in the Hebrew, uh, Shema Israel Adonai Elohim Adonai Echad. Now, this word echad is also found in the Quran. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, wa lam yakul lahu kufuan ahad. That he is God, the one and only. There's nothing comparable unto God. So, in the Islamic tradition, God is not only uh, one, but he's completely unique. He is completely dissimilar to creation. It's a radical monotheism. He's completely transcendent, but he's also imminent. And this is an, ultimately God is a mystery. What we know about God is only what he has chosen to reveal about himself, right? And some might say, well, don't say himself, say herself or itself, right? But God uses a masculine. Now, Muslims obviously don't believe that God is a man or a woman, but that's how he's chosen to reveal about himself, right? So God is also imminent. This is very important. The Quran speaks of this. The Quran says that we are closer to man than his jugular vein. And many other indications of this. And I'll end with this, inshallah ta'ala, God willing, and then we'll open it up. Um, after one of the battles, there was this woman that was running around completely frantic because she had lost her infant son. And this was, uh, and the prophet was there, and a group of companions were there, and uh, she was completely hysterical. Uh, she lost her little son. And uh, she finally sees him and picks him up and hugs him and kisses him and breastfeeds him. And the prophet said, did you see that woman? 
He said, Atarona hadhil mar'ata tarihatan waladaha fin nar. He said, can you imagine this lady throwing her child in a fire? After all that love that she showed to him. And they said, uh, he said, no, by God, no. La wallahi. And then he said, peace be upon him, Allahu arhamu bi ibadihi min hadihi bi waladiha. God is more merciful to his servants than this woman was to her child. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, here is using a, a, a feminine image to demonstrate the love and mercy of God. Now, this is sound hadith, right? Um, and this is very interesting. In fact, one of the names of God in the, in the Quran is Ar-Rahman, which means the infinitely merciful. And uh, the word uh, for womb, the, the womb of a mother, called uh, Raham or Rechem in, in Hebrew, is from the same root word, right? So there's a subtle analogy going on here, right? The love of God. So this idea, this, this idea of, of, of filial love is also found in our tradition, right? That God is like a parent, like a father, like a mother. But Muslims also believe that um, this idea that Jesus is begotten of God, the literal son of God, uh, that he shares a pre-existent nature with God, that God does not have an ontological precedence or priority over Christ, this idea, Muslims would believe, was a later development in Christian history that was eventually made Christian orthodoxy. So I think I've ruffled enough feathers and raised enough issues uh, to have a discussion or a Q&A session. Um, like I said, if I offended anyone, it's certainly not our intention. Um, I'm sorry if I bored, made you bored. Um, but uh, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak, and I appreciate your uh, show of respect. Thank you very much. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Is there any questions or comments? What time do you guys usually pray Maghrib? Oh, there's one. Okay. So, um, so mo most of you uh, received note cards, so if you'd like to uh, write down any questions and pass them to the side and uh, collect them and give them to Ali Atari. I can collect the questions. Okay, you can just pass them to the end of the row. The Quran says that God knows everything you've ever done, and He's going to judge everything you've ever done. So you don't know whether or not you're going to heaven or hell. Is that your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, the Muslim um, doesn't. The question, please? Yeah. The the question is, um, d does. The Muslims don't know whether they're going to heaven or hell. In other words, the Muslim doesn't have an assurance of salvation. Now, um, there's various traditions that deal with this. Uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, um, uh, he said, whoever, man shahida an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadur Rasulullah dakhala jannah. Whoever believes in the oneness of God and in the prophethood of Muhammad, peace be upon him, will enter paradise. So Muslims do have an assurance. But Muslims don't like to talk about that because it puffs them up with pride. You know, it's, it's, it's self-righteousness. We don't like to rub it in people's face and say, you're going to hell, aren't you? But I'm going to heaven, right? Uh, Muslims consider this behavior to be um, uh, um, um, impious or with, um, demonstrating bad character. Um, but there is an assurance in our tradition. Um, now, Muslims also believe that um, there is a possible purification process for people that were recalcitrant sinners, um, punishment in the grave, purification and fire, and things like that. And this is dealing with a whole separate issue. Um, but the bottom line is that even the prophet himself, when he was asked, you know, what will be your end, right? Uh, and he said, um, no, they, they asked him, he said, the prophet said, no one has entered into paradise by their works. So this is a very common misconception that non-Muslims <coughs> believe that Muslims believe that they can kind of work their way up to righteousness. You do enough deeds, right, and you're, you're justified with God. And the prophet said, no person is entered into paradise by his or her deeds. No person. You can never justify yourself through your deeds. The Quran says that uh, if anyone is saved on that day, it's only from the mercy of God. And then the companion said, not even you, a messenger of God, not even you, who perfected worship, who's the best of creation, 
who's the master of the children of Adam? And he said, not even me, except that my Lord wraps me in mercy. Not even the prophet, peace be upon him. And this is out of his, out of his uh, humility. Right? Obviously, Muslims believe that uh, the prophet is um, uh, in paradise, obviously. And, uh, he's the best of creation, and he's the beloved of God, and things like that. Uh, and there's various traditions that deal with this as well. There's a tradition of the prophet in which he said, uh, a certain man was on, a, uh, on an island, and he had worshipped God for hundreds of years, and he was a very pious person. He never committed any uh, um, sins and things like that. And on the Day of Judgment, uh, God told him, Enter paradise, bi rahmati, by my mercy. And the man said, Bad ya Rabbi bi amali. He said, No, my Lord, by my works. Go to paradise by my works. And then the prophet said, Then God took his eyesight and put it on one side of the scale, and all of his good works on the other side of the scale. And the eyesight fell, and his works were raised. And God told the man that my blessing of giving you the ability to see is more than all of your good works. Would you like to continue this reckoning? And the man said, Bi rahmatik, by your mercy, unto paradise. So this is not something that Muslims, uh, you know, like uh, there are some people that have approached me many times. You're going to burn in hell. You know, judge not unless you be judged. Right, it's from Matthew. So, so you are certain that you are not going to hell? Am I certain? Inshallah. God willing. God willing. Yes? Uh, I have one question. Who, who can become a Muslim? I mean, is Islam is open for anyone, everyone, or there are someone who is... And Good the question. Other way, the other part is... How to become a Muslim? Like if I meet someone and he wants to become Muslim, what should he do or say to yes. believe to become Muslim? Um, Islam is a universal religion, like we said. Anyone can be a Muslim. Um, it's not a, you know, people say it's a, you know, it's a religion of a certain race or anything. It's um, a misconception. Um, in fact, you know, although, you know, 95% of Arabs are Muslims, 85% uh, of Muslims are non-Arab. In fact, Indonesia, right, it's 200 million Muslims, and by itself outnumbers the entire Arab world uh, put together. Um, so this is a religion open to anyone. Um, what does one need to do to become a Muslim? Uh, is to testify in the oneness of God uh, and in the messengership, messengership of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And when they do that, they're already accepting the previous revelations and dispensations and the, the prophethood of Jesus and Moses and Abraham and all of them as well. Um, but there are fundamental differences between Islam and Christianity and Judaism, and um, it would not be fair to just give a lecture about our similarities without touching on those differences. There are differences. The point is to talk about them with respect and try to understand why those differences are there. Right. But yeah, it's a religion that's open for everyone. Anyone can be a Muslim. If you're rich, poor, black, white. Right. The Prophet, peace be upon him, actually is the first person in recorded history to equalize humanity based on skin color. There's no statement prior to him. He said, a black man is not greater than a white man, nor a white over a black, nor an Arab over a non-Arab, uh, except in piety, right? I mean, Paul said, there's neither Greek nor Jew, we're all one in Christ, but he mentioned skin color, right? Uh, so the prophet, peace be upon him, is the first person in recorded history uh, to equalize humanity based on skin color, which is, which is really important. And this prophet, like we said, was very fair-skinned himself. He didn't have dark skin. Yes. What does Islam say about trying to convert people? What does Islam say about trying to convert people? Um, good question. Um, so uh, we believe that um, that Muslims are representatives of God on the earth. In fact, all people are representatives of God, and Muslims believe that Islam is something that benefits people. Right? It's something that's good for people. Right? So this is called the da'wah. This is called you know, Islamic propagation, if you will. And there's different ways of doing it. You know, people think that in order for you to you know, talk to people about Islam, or in order, in order for you to propagate Islam, you have to stand up and give a speech or something. Right? Um, but there are different ways of, of calling people to Islam. Just having good character is one of the most, probably the most powerful of ways. Right. And the Prophet said that I was only sent to perfect your character. This is very important. Um, 
having good character is an extremely important prophetic attribute to have. Um, so uh, being a good person, having good character, and calling people to truth because we have concern for people, not out of self-righteousness. And it's a thin line. It's very difficult for people sometimes to make the difference between them, you know, uh, not to think that we're better than anyone else. It's very important. The prophet was extremely humble. The prophet, peace be upon him, uh, had great concern for people. He was he constantly prayed for people. Um, um, so this type of thing is we call people towards a certain path, uh, because we believe that it will benefit them, and that's a duty of every Muslim, in their own capacity. It might just be, you know, offering someone your seat on the on the subway or the BART or something. Although I did that one time, there was an old lady that came into the BART, and I got up and I said, "You want to sit down?" And I didn't know she was a feminist. She said, "Well, you think you're stronger than me or something? You're a man." So no, I'm just whatever. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, don't the two words salam and Islam mean different things? <coughs> yeah, um, salam is a, yeah, the, the words salam and Islam, do they mean different things? I mean, the root word is the same, right? Salama is a triliteral root. Um, so salam is a noun, means peace. Islam is an infinitive, it's called mustar in Arabic, uh, which means submission. Um, so the root word is the same. Um, so the Semitic languages are unique in the sense that all of the words are derived from triliteral and sometimes quadriliteral or hexaliteral uh, uh, root words, um, just like Hebrew as well. There are subtle differences though in the definition, but it's from the same root word. Yes, sir? Um, when you're talking about the Song of Songs, uh, mm -hmm. 5, 10 through 16, um, you mentioned that Muhammad is described there. However, I'm trying to figure out um, where your basis is that that's like the prophetic literature right there like how do you know that it's talking about Muhammad um, great question great question <clears throat> now classical tri Christian theologians like Origen of Alexandria have you heard of Origen Origen is uh, probably the most, most prolific of the pre-Nicene fathers he wrote over a thousand books uh, although he was eventually declared a heretic um, in 553. And most of the early church fathers were actually declared heretics, but Christianity is very much indebted to Origen for his great works um, on first principles. So Origen believed that scripture has multiple levels of meaning, right? In fact, he said infinite levels of meaning. So there's an apparent meaning, a contextualized or historical meaning, an exoteric meaning, and then there are esoteric meanings or foreshadowings or typologies of future events. This is classical Christian uh, exegesis of the biblical text. Uh, so, for example, um, Origen would say that uh, you know, there's, there's stories in the Old Testament that seem to indicate the coming of Christ. Now, eventually, Origen was condemned for that belief, but interestingly, um, Matthew also believed that, and Matthew is an evangelist who wrote a gospel, but Christians are not about to condemn Matthew. Uh, so Matthew will actually quote from the Old Testament and say, look, uh, a virgin conceived, and his name is Emmanuel, and this is a reference to Christ. Uh, but if you go back to Isaiah, right, chapter 7, and you read chapter 8, Emmanuel is born uh, in chapter 8. So the Jew would say to the Christian, what are you talking about? This has nothing to do with Jesus. This is very contextualized. It's dealing with a sign that Isaiah gave to King Ahaz, and this child is born in chapter 8, and the Christian would retort and say, however, there are multiple esoteric meanings of Scripture. That's what Matthew would have said, who wrote a gospel. So my contention is, and maybe it's not a description of the Prophet Muhammad, but it's a very uncanny I think you would agree if you read the entire section and then compared it to uh, Shemaiah literature. It's, it's, it's very close to a description of the prophet. So one would say, for example, well, this is a, des a description of Solomon, a, a woman describing her husband. Or, or that Origen would say, well, that's the, the exoteric context. But there is a foreshadowing. There's a Mohammedan typology in this type of thing as well. So my basis for saying that is classical Christian exegesis and evangelists, 
whom Christians believe are inspired by God. Christians believe Matthew is inspired by God. And he believed that very same thing. That scripture has multiple levels of meaning. Yes, sir? Um, in Pakistan and in Syria, mm -hmm. I learned the greetings, Salaam Alaikum, and the response, Wa Alaikum as Salaam. Mm -hmm. And I made some good friends. Now I find myself greatly confused. Do you believe, and do any Muslims believe, that a person who commits suicide or who murders others is able to <coughs> enter paradise? And depending what your answer is to that, what should the rest of us feel? What, how should we react? What can you do about it? Great question. Um, part of the problem is that Muslims are not vocal enough these days, uh, Muslims in the West. Uh, and Muslims are kind of allowing non-Muslims, not just non-Muslims, people who have agendas, people who hate Islam, uh, to define our terminology. They define our terminology. Like they say that jihad means holy war. Uh, holy war is an oxymoron. Jihad doesn't mean holy war. Holy war is har muqaddas. In Arabic doesn't make any sense. It's like saying a straight homosexual. Um, um, jumbo shrimp or four-sided triangle. <laughs> Um, so we have to we have to define our own terminology. So the the definition of a martyr, right, a shaheed that we're given is that a shaheed is someone who kills himself and innocent people in the process. That's not our definition of a shaheed. That's not our definition. That's their definition. Uh, martyrdom is a noble thing. Muslims believe that martyrdom is a noble thing. Um, uh, but we have to be careful who we label martyrs. Now God knows best. I'm not trying to judge anyone. But this was extremely important amongst early Christians as well. For example, we're talking about Origen. There's another early church father named Tertullian of Carthage, who was probably the greatest Christian apologist of the pre-Nicene era. He's also declared a heretic, though, uh, eventually. Um, but nonetheless, uh, he considered it a hallmark of Christian faith to give your life. That's why if you read early Christian history, martyrologies uh, are a major important uh, uh, aspect of early Christian piety like the martyrdom of Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp of Smyrna, and the Colosseum, the later legends about Peter being crucified upside down, Paul being beheaded in Rome, and Jesus, according to Christians, was a martyr, uh, giving your life for a noble cause, right? But if someone, you know, decides to uh, become a vigilante <coughs> and kill himself and innocent people in the process, uh, uh, Muslims have to be vocal in, in condemning such things. Now, again, um, God is the ultimate judge. I have no idea what people are going through. If you go to, to Gaza right now, I mean, it's worse than, it's like a concentration camp. I mean, it's just terrible. It's deplorable. It's unbelievable what these people are going through. And I, I hope uh, upon none of us to be in that position. But what would we actually do in that situation? What else is there to do in that situation? These people are completely desperate. So I'm not judging anyone, right? Because I'd probably do much worse if I was in that situation. May God never put us in that type of situation. It's really amazing what's going on there. Really, really deplorable. Um, um, but uh, that's, that's the main issue, is that Muslims need to define their own terminology. And it's interesting because, you know, again, people have an agenda. You need to justify a war. You have to justify the killing of 400,000 innocent Iraqis, women and children. How do you do that? You know, let's just sweep it under the rug and worry about what some guy in Pakistan did what some guy in Pakistan did. Let's, let's worry about that uh, and uh, forget about these innocent people that are being killed in Afghanistan and Iraq and what's going on in, in Gaza. So this is, a, this is a process of pseudo-speciation. They're trying to make Muslims look less than human, so it's easy to kill them. Because they know these Amer American soldiers, you know, who are right out of high school, any of them, they go to the Middle East, they kill people, they kill innocent people, they come back, and they're just gone. They're, 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 they're psycho psychologically, they're gone. So there, there has to be a steady indoctrination that these people are our enemy. These people want to, want to threaten our way of life. They're trying to usurp the government and take over and things like that. These people are not even human. Um, so these things make headlines a lot in this country, right? Pseudo-speciation in order to justify a war. There was a, a, a group of 
A lot of people don't know this, but you know, up in GTU, I hear about these things. There was a group of Christian terrorists. You guys hear about this? The, the Hutaris? You guys know about that? People don't know about this. A few months ago in the Midwest, a group of Christian terrorists, you go on their website, there's a cross, and, you know, and you know, they're, they're very well armed, they're trained, trying to take over the government. But most people never heard about it, right? Because you, know, you don't need to hear about that. We're going to sweep that under the rug and worry about what some guy in Pakistan did. Yes, um, there's a difference of opinion about that. Amongst, the question. Yes, the, que the question is, um, when the Quran says, people of the book, uh, the, the Christians and Jews that believe in the Bible, which type of Christians and Jews are they talking about? Um, there's an opinion that it's referring to um, the Christians and Jews that were dominant at the time of the revelation of the Quran, which were Trinitarian Christians, uh, and the Jews that were living at the time. Um, there's another opinion that it's referring to Christians that um, believe that Jesus uh, was not equal to God or to the Father, um, which is uh, uh, closer to like uh, ancient Ebionite Christology or Arianist Christology uh, or Unitarian Christianity, which is very, very much in the minority today. But I think the dominant opinion is that Ahlul Kitab refers to the dominant Christian denomination at the time, which was Trinitarian Christianity. <clears throat> yeah. uh, <clears throat> I, I want to compliment the one thing you said just a moment ago, and then I want to uh, add commentary to her point <clears throat> about the Christian. Then I would like to know how you reconcile this modern creation. Uh, one, it's been said in certain circles when you're talking about definitions that people have said that uh, Moses was the law, Jesus was the mercy, and that Islam or Muslims are the wrath of God. <laughs> and that uh, its uh, uh, explanation of its faith was done by the sword in terms of creating the first true theocracy in the world as far as a religion with a state. Islam, Muhammad, was the first creator of a true theocracy, theocracy in terms of um, you know, world expansion, Spain, the Moors, and so on, Africa, Arabia, various places of the world. Also, uh, I wanted to just make a quick comment that uh, the, uh, the original Christians during that time that she just mentioned was what she was saying, the Trinitarians, and that that big change in Christianity came about from the Council of Nicaea. I was wondering if you could speak to that, the mm -hmm. commentary, that the original Christians pretty much believed like, like Muslims in, in one God and one that there was no sun and so on yeah. and so forth. But at the Council of Nicaea with Christians that changed and the Bible says that in Antioch they became known as Christians was like five hundred years after Jesus. But my point is how do Muslims reconcile their history of, of uh, Islam being exported, some say through war or through the sword when they went into other countries exporting the religion. How do you guys reconcile that today when the American perception is Islam is not a peaceful religion because its history, its origin was, even though I realize it was in self-defense because people were trying to kill Muhammad in Mecca and Medina and he had to establish self-defense, but they take it now as if you defend or fight back, they're saying the Muslim religion is terroristic, violent, because it was established in Spain, it was established in these other places. How do you reconcile that with peace? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, definitely, all of the military expeditions of the Prophet had a defensive aspect to them. Um, that's important to realize as well. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because, you know, it's Islam is a religion of the sword because uh, the only Muslim polity in the history of Islam that, uh, whose foreign policy was based on war booty, that's their entire fiscal system, was a, a Muslim polity called the Bani Umayyah, which lasted a few years and then it went out. And, uh, that's, that, that was basically their policy. Was that they were Muslim Zionists. You know, the aim was to gain land, right? Uh, so that's, that was a sad part of our history, actually. Um, but, you know, human beings are imperfect. We don't believe that Muslims are perfect. We believe Islam is perfect. And certainly no one, I don't claim, I would never say that Christianity is a violent religion and that the aim of Christianity is world domination and that uh, 
the teachings of Christ and, 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 and Paul are, are, are the, the, the basis of world domination and imperialism and things like that. But if you look throughout Christian history, you know, 70,000 Muslims killed in one weekend in 1099 of the Common Era, blood ran knee high to the horse, that's a sad event of Christian history and of Muslim history and world history. So these types of things have happened over time. Um, Muslim Spain, Al Andalusia, if you ask any Jewish scholar at or Jewish rabbi professor at GTU, and I asked him, you know, what was the greatest age of Judaism? He said, Muslim Spain. <laughs> Very quickly, Muslim Spain, Al Andalusia. That was our golden age. That's what he said. <coughs> that was our golden age. I said, what about David, Solomon? And then, no, no, no. Muslim Spain was our golden age. Then how did Muslim Spain end? 1492, when Columbus saw the ocean blue, and they killed the Muslims and Jews. <laughs> it, it ended in genocide. That's why many of the Jews, they actually went down into Muslim countries when the Christians came and were slaughtering everyone. And there was an inquisition and whatnot. And obviously, I don't believe those Christians represented the true uh, teachings of Christ. <laughs> obviously not. I'm not making that claim. But it's very interesting because uh, when a Muslim does something stupid, immediately it's, oh, he's just following Islam. That's what Islam says to do. But when a Christian does something like that, oh, he's, you know, he's, 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 he's a deviant. Right? That's, that's, not, that's, not, that's not what Christianity teaches. He's a, he's a terrible Christian. Not even a Christian, right? This type, it's a very big double standard. It's a very big double standard. Um, with regards to your question about Nicaea, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of misconceptions about what happened at the Synod in Nicaea in 325. Uh, Dan Brown, in his book, The Da Vinci Code, he makes some claims that are unsubstantiated. He's trying to sell books. I mean, he's just an author. And, but what did happen at Nicaea was that Jesus was officially declared equal with God. Um, they didn't even deal with the Holy Spirit. That came in 381. That came at uh, Constantinople under Theodosius. They were just dealing with Christ. Who is Christ? And interestingly, the only Christian bishops that were invited to Nicaea were proto-Orthodox bishops. In other words, uh, bishops that already believed that Jesus was divine in some way. So... They're not going to invite, you know, Ebionite Christians or Nazarene Christians or Marcionite or Gnostic Christians or uh, um, uh, Patripassianists or anything like that. They're not going to invite them, modalists, you know, uh, because they weren't bishops. They didn't have the power. So this was just a small group, maybe the minority group, because history teaches us. But in 360 of the Common Era, this is after Nicaea, 360 of the Common Era, the vast majority of Christian bishops preached Ebionite Christology. Uh, or Arianist Christology, which is an adoptionist Christology. So Arius said that Jesus is katisma teleon, he's the best of creation, and he's not equal to, with the Father. This was the dominant Christology after Nicaea. So this was a minority group of Christians that were very well funded, very influential, that Constantine invited to Nicaea, and they voted, and based on the vote, Jesus now is co-equal, co-substantial, and co-eternal with the Father, and that the Father and Son... Um, although the Father has causal priority over the Son, whatever that means, <laughs> he does not have ontological or uh, temporal priority. I don't mean to be glib about it. I'm just trying to quote what the actual um, creed actually says, or the findings of the Synod. Yeah, so this was a much later development. Yes. Historians will say, like Bart Ehrman will say, that the original Christology of the original Christians was very much Muslim. They were Jews that practiced the Torah, that worshipped in the synagogues. They simply believed that Jesus was the Messiah. But that was it. That was, there was no difference. Uh, they, they considered themselves to be a sect of Judaism. They called themselves the way, a sirat, a tariqa. Right? Uh, they didn't consider themselves a different or distinct religion. This is from a historical standpoint. It's not my opinion. This is what historians are saying. Yes, sir? Um, could you uh, clarify... Yes. Very good question. The question is about a, a tax that non-Muslims are required to pay. It's called the jizya tax uh, when living in a Muslim state. Um, interestingly, there's a book. There's a book called Answering Islam. Okay, that was a website. But in 1993, this man named Norman Geisler and another man named Abdul Salib, which means slave of the cross. He's supposed to be a Muslim apostate. Probably doesn't exist, but um, I'll be a figment of Geisler's imagination. Anyway, he wrote a book called Answering Islam. Right. And in that book, he says in that book, he says that many of the Christians in North Africa willingly accepted Islam because of its low taxes and stress on brotherhood. 
That's what Norman Geisler says in answering Islam. Now, obviously, I mean, he's not going to come out and say they actually believed in Islam, and you know, that, that can't be true. Uh, but it must have been low taxes. So the Romans at the time, right? This is this is a, this is Byzantium. This is the the Christian Roman Empire. They were charging unbelievable taxes on the Christians, right? Everyone has to pay taxes. What did Mark Twain say? There's only two certain things: death and taxes, right? So Muslims are required to pay zakat. Muslims have to pay 2.5 at least percent of their income that goes to the poor if they can afford it, right? Uh, the jizya tax. So non-Muslims don't have to pay zakat, obviously, but they have to pay jizya tax for the Muslim government in exchange for protection from the state. And the jizya tax is much lower than the zakat. And it's only for Christians and Jews that can't afford it. If you can't afford it, then you don't have to pay it, obviously, and it's not demanded. In exchange for, um, for protection. For example, if a group of Jews in Muslim Spain was paying the jizya tax to the Muslim government, uh, and then a group of rogue Muslims decide we're going to go and we're going to attack this Jewish village, then it is incumbent upon the Muslim polity to fight that Muslim group that's attacking the Jews because they're paying the Jews the tax. They have protection. They're, they're guaranteed protection by paying that tax. But everyone has to pay taxes. I have to pay taxes. You have to pay taxes. You know. <laughs> yes, ma'am? How many versions of the Quran are there? Versions of Quran. There is one version, but many translations. There's one version, it's in Arabic. Now, there are different spelling conventions of the Quran in Arabic, different ways of spelling words, right? So they found, you know, some masahif or some codices in Yemen that left out the alif in the name Ibrahim, for example. That's not a different version of the Quran. That's a spelling convention, right? Um, so there's one version, and it's in the Arabic language, different ways of spelling things, sometimes different ways of pronouncing things, um, but many translations. hope that clarifies. Yes, sir? Um, so from a Muslim perspective, what is the one message of Moses, Jesus? Good question. From a Muslim perspective, what is the message of Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad? Um, I would say... Um, that it is the the commandments of Moses, Jesus, uh, in the in that in the Torah, which shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love thy neighbor as thyself. And before that, hero Israel or hero world, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Um, so this is a message that is rooted in love, in mercy, and in piety towards God. I would say that those three concepts are absolutely foundational in the message of these three great luminaries. Yes? What is the Muslim understanding of evil in the world? How that got into a world created by Jesus? Great question. Why is there evil in the world? Muslims don't believe that creation has fallen like Christians believe. Um, Muslims don't believe in uh, it's called al-khatiyatul asliya, or original sin, that we inherited the sin of our father Adam. Muslims believe there's evil in the world because it's a byproduct of limited free will of human beings. So the human being has limited free will, not absolute free will, uh, and we don't believe in, in a rigid determinism either. God knows everything, obviously, and he knows what's going to happen because he's God. If he didn't know that, then he wouldn't be God. And we have to remember that this is something that we can't conceive of this, but God is outside of time. God is outside of time, space, and direction. He transcends that. You know, it's not, you know, um, uh, it's not, it was a Thursday night, um, May, whatever, 2010, for God. God is outside of time, right? Uh, so if we looked at this whole thing from God's perspective, which is impossible, uh, we would understand that, but we'll, ultimately we won't understand. But God knows what we will do, but Muslims believe that there's a, uh, there's a limited free will of the human being uh, where he makes or she makes choices, um, and they're taken to account for those choices. This is a doctrine called acquisition. So the reason why there's evil in the world is because of a misuse of free will, of limited free will. And the human beings are taken to account for that. Even though God knows what the person will do, that's because he's God. And he's expected to know because he's all-powerful and he's all-knowing. And if he did not know that, then he wouldn't be God. So this is why. A misuse of free will. So Muslims actually believe that if there, if there were no human beings on earth, then there would be no evil on earth. Because Muslims don't believe that nature is evil. Muslims don't believe that creation is evil. 
inherently or naturally that when a lion attacks a zebra and goes for the jugular, that's based on instinct, that's based on nature, that's not an evil act. But when a guy shoots another person in the head and robs him, that's a, a demonstration of a misuse of free will and therefore evil. So God created evil in the Islamic tradition. God created evil and he created evil actions, but human beings acquire them, right? And the book of Isaiah also, in response to Zoroastrian elements that had crept into Juda Judaism, in Isaiah chapter 45, I believe, uh, God says, um, we made the light and darkness, we created evil and peace. Right? So the Lord does all of these things, as Isaiah says. So God did create evil, because if he didn't create something, then again, he can't be God. He's the creator of everything. So Muslims believe that God created evil, or the capacity in the human being to engage in evil action. And that's out of his mercy, that's actually a mercy that God gave us the limited free will to make a choice. Um, but it is the human being's misuse of that free will that leads to evil in the world. The Prophet actually said that everyone is born uh, into a natural state of purity. It's a hadith of the Prophet. And it is only parents and society that make him different types of religions and beliefs and so on and so forth.